In this Climate Gen podcast with Professor Jason Box, we discuss how high resolution tools reveal the Greenland ice sheet is tipping from a regime of winter snowfall to extreme deluges of rain. Jason calls these atmospheric river rapids. These intense downpours add mechanisms that accelerate the breakup of the ice sheet and are not reflected in the IPCC reports. We discuss how these mechanisms have similar characteristics to what we see in the increase in flash flooding events around the world, which are directly linked to the increase in global heating. In the next episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Joe Rom from Pennsylvania State University about his analysis and scrutiny of the global offsets market and how they're being abused by large corporations and nation states alike. This summary version is edited from the full interview, included are the key points from the discussion, and the full version can be accessed by all YouTube and Patreon members. Thank you for listening. Jason, it's good to see you again. Thank you for taking the time. I want to speak to you about a new paper you've published, and it's about Greenland, and it seems to be this sort of new phenomenon that you're seeing, which is atmospheric river rapids. But can you start by just explaining why you're not seeing the snow that we would be expecting you to see on Greenland? The event that we studied was in September at the time of year when it should be snowing. So, of course, as the climate heats up, we cross this genuine threshold tipping point where there is rain instead of snow. And the study was really about atmospheric rivers. We've heard about them, especially like last year, the US West Coast, California had record snow. It was doing a lot of damage. And that was a chain of moisture laden, so-called rivers in the atmosphere, dumping extreme amounts of of rainfall and, and snowfall to to California. Well, as it turns out, it's not just California. Antarctica had this extreme temperature increase that shattered records at, at high on the Antarctic plateau due to an atmospheric river. Well, I noticed in our recordings that we had this extreme uh, rainfall, 200 millimeters. If that was Uh, snowfall, it would be more than two meters of of snow. And this was in a 24 hour period. And and so it it makes us think about the extreme flooding that we've seen in Vermont, Spain, Turkey, China, Russia, Mexico, just in the last couple of weeks, as the globe has hit these all time high temperatures, that's driven by El Nino coming on, and even uh, a sunspot, which actually produces more sunlight to the earth. So we we have a, a terrible, perfect storm at the moment. The the escalator of of average warming bringing us up, but then the El Ninos are bumping that higher, and this sunspot thing might bump it a little bit higher as well. So there's there's this extreme heat on right now, and it's just shattering records around the the globe. And so you know, I, I started to see the connection of Greenland with you know flooding that's that's happening now and we we looked in fine detail at an atmospheric river because we have a new tool that's like data driven and it's a numerical weather computerized high fidelity state of the art um convection permitting uh, non hydrostatic you know just this this complex um uh, so-called reanalysis and it allowed us to see in much greater detail and there we saw what we gave this name of rapids within the atmospheric river there were like four of these like curtains of updrafts along flow so this is the atmospheric river and within that were these four updraft curtains 200 kilometers long two kilometers deep flowing about two to three kilometers above the surface and then it runs into the greenland ice sheet and produces this deluge insane amount of rainfall like we're seeing that's causing flash floods in in the news around the globe and and so this you know and it, and it occurred to me i was like wow we're we're crossing a new paradigm in climatology where we're no longer focused on the gradually upward uh, rising curves you know you see all these curves and you know sea levels like this this smooth curve but but it's not because of the extremes uh, sea level has 
storm surges that produces flooding, Superstorm Sandy uh, flooded the New York subway, $60 billion damage. These flooding events, it, it it's killing people. It's it's leading to record insurance claims. It, it has direct, you know, high economic impacts. On the ice sheet, when you get one of these river rapids, you just described a deluge of, of water. What actually is the impact on the ice sheet? Uh, hydrofracturing the ice. Um because water is heavier than ice, and so it can exert higher pressure in in fissures, and and so it it, it opens up it, this hydrofracturing process. Imagine like a column that's that's a kilometer deep in the ice sheet. So there's an extreme pressure being forced at the bed. It even lifts the ice sheet up, and that allows the ice sheet to flow faster. Hydro, so hydrofracturing, faster flow, so-called thermal collapse, which is internal heating of the ice. That's a softer internal ice. Uh, so softer ice uh, deforms more readily. Um, the the water then rushes out into the fjord and drives uh, uh, an accelerated heat exchange with a warming ocean. So I've just listed four physical factors that are among an even longer list of factors that's not encoded in the ice sheet models used to project future sea level rise. Uh, so the, the IPCC still has, despite a, a great effort from the scientific community, so-called blind spots. There's, there's all these blind spots and they're actually known factors, but they're not yet encoded in the projection. So the impacts of, of a lot of water delivery expanding the faster flow season of the ice sheet, uh, expanding the melt season um, is, is a great example of multiplying effects, stacking on top of each other, producing this higher fidelity that you get out of nature than, is, than can possibly be encoded in a model, which the models produce necessarily produce sluggish uh, responses. Uh, so we really have to look at observational records of what's what what can we see is happening, and when we compare that with with uh, model projections, and this is also true for atmospheric warming. It's true for how the wind changes. Uh, the the global climate models they don't produce the observed increase or changes in wind patterns. They don't produce the observed uh, the rate of observed warming that that we see. Uh, so these are the blind spots. We're flying into the future facing backwards. We can see the past, but our, our view of the future is still very blurry. And so these, these extremes are like surprise factors that, that uh, oh, surprise, you know, oh, we learned something new, you know, the hard way. And these new tools that you're talking about, they're not, it's not real time, but it, it's bringing it much closer so that you can see in, you know, recent impacts, because we're seeing this sort of acceleration of impacts, which has got a lot of people, you know, on the edge of their seat, as you see these multiple heat domes, and you see, you know, um, these deluges in all around the world. And you've got these tools where you can see processes on Greenland, which are absolutely mind boggling to someone like me. And you're saying that there are instances of possibly in Antarctica that where you could, you know, we don't know, maybe there could be something going on there as well. But all of this together is shaping up how we view the world right now, today, under this sort of stepping up of climate change. Um, can you talk a little bit about the link between the heat waves and flooding that we're seeing in general? The surface is obviously warmer. Um, there's more heat and moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, when there is some precipitation rainfall onto this warm surface, it, it quickly evaporates up into the air and that, that heat is, is recycled into the air. Um, something that's called the monsoon, and that is any surface soil moisture that evaporates up, produces clouds, they release more heat and, and it, it actually draws in uh, moisture and into the cloud and it's like a, you know, like a precipitation engine. And these things are now supercharged. Uh, so a hot surface drawing in a, a, a higher humidity atmosphere, uh, measurements show that the global humidity just keeps rising and the water vapor pressure 
it goes up as the square uh, with uh, the square of temperature. So there's this nonlinearity that as we elevate temperatures, uh, the moisture holding capacity of the air uh, strongly increases. And, and that's why uh, now when it rains, it pours. Uh, connect that with uh, a super warm surface. It's evaporating up. Uh, and then atmospheric rivers can get sucked into that. And we saw that in uh, May of 2023 in Europe. Italy had flooding. And it was a case of, okay, you've got this storm, this low pressure storm system, but it was sucking in moisture, uh, producing record flooding uh, across Italy. So now we have global sea surface temperatures, record high. That's the producing the conditions with which there can be yet more moisture put into the atmosphere at these higher temperatures uh, in the air and, you know, and sea surface. Um, it's the kind of, it's the ingredients for supercharged uh, weather systems, supercharged uh, clouds, supercharged uh, rain. So we can say that, you know, some people say, oh, it's it's weather, you know, it's just weather. No, it, it's not just weather when it's setting records. And it's not just weather when it's in a background that has higher moisture, higher heat. In the past, which is, as you say, you know, we've got a, we've got a good view of the past, not such a good one of the future. But as we move forward, we're, we're used to having an extreme summer. And then maybe five years later, we'll have another extreme summer. And, but there may be gentle increases. But now we're having this summer, this year, on the back of last year, which was a massive drought and heat heat stress in Europe. Do you think that we're entering a period now where next summer will be the same or, you know, might not be more, but it might be as chaotic? Uh, next year should be worse because the El Nino takes time for it to eject heat from the oceans. That's, that's what it is. And uh, scientists are already predicting 2024 to be uh, warmer than this year, and, and it will have those supercharged uh, weather extremes. So this, um, you know, I just don't want to say new normal, because the, the baseline is always shifting upward. So yes, the normal is always changing. But now we have extreme climate events to that are in our face all the time with dire economic impacts, uh, not just killing people, but also killing nature that surrounds. I mean, look at the fires uh, that we have, record fires. Um, we can expect more of this. Uh, and as so as carbon emissions continue elevating in the atmosphere, that's what's driving all of this. Uh, we can expect this kind of weather uh, chaos to continue and only until we hit net zero globally, not just nationally, globally, um, I, I would guess that's optimistically the year 2050. Then we would stabilize at something like 450 parts per million CO2. Right now we're at like 420 something. So another 25 parts per million, it, it just means that the, the heat within that system will be more and and the the extremes will be stronger. Okay, so it's going to get worse. It's supercharged. And we're at the beginning of this sort of destabling pit. Well, we're not at the beginning. We're at the beginning of, the, of actually ex experiencing it. It's probably a better term in the global north, it's especially. But in... You segued quite neatly into talking about defusing the problem, and this is um, takes me back to Paris when I was I interviewed you in Paris for the first time, and you ended by saying mitigation matters, and then in Glasgow you talked about mitigation again, and you tied it very closely to the to the rate of the problems we're facing. Can you reiterate that and just sort of? Uh, Confirm that's still the case. Right. Uh, despite all the doom and gloom that we face, it will always be true that the less we can emit, the the better. What that does is delay the, the bigger consequences into the future. And we can't turn it off now. Uh, we can 
reduce emissions and get into carbon dioxide removal because we can't sustain global society above 400 parts per million. It, it's a destabilizing effect, a conflict multiplier, especially through the loss of food and water security. Uh, so as the, the jet stream becomes more slowly moving, sticking in these heat domes across all three continents in the north now, um, that's directly impacting uh, the breadbasket regions, food production, again, loss of food and water security, driving global food price commodity spikes, uh, and yeah, global Um and, and so uh, what can individuals do? Uh, taking shorter showers, cycling, and going vegan won't be enough. Those are, those are good things. Uh, what, what's needed is policy to uh, phase out fossil fuels uh, as quickly as possible. How to get policymakers to do that? It's by supporting the movements uh, that... Uh, and so Gandhi showed, and it's been subsequently demonstrated time and again, there are three key ingredients with which to change policy. You can't ask nicely. Um, you, you do so nonviolently. That's important. That's what Gandhi showed. But those movements need to be sustained and mass participation. So sustained, mass participation, nonviolent. It's only with all three of those things can... Uh, people and individuals can get involved in those movements that are uh, mass participation, right? That's people getting involved, sustained. That that means not just marching on a Saturday afternoon. It actually means marching all the time, and 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 not just marching, but the nonviolent direct action uh, that that gets um, policymakers' attention. This is kind of the sort of process of taking individual action, you're using your agency as an individual. You know, individuals can plug into movements, and there are many, and it's a transgenerational kind of movement. It, it requires participation, not just from the young, uh, who are kind of usually the vanguard of these movements, but uh, older persons have a, a very strong influence and, and, and the connection that produces uh, an effective movement when there is this um, kind of all hands on deck to convince uh, policymakers because policymakers also have a lot of vested interests that want to keep the status quo because that is extremely profitable for uh, individuals in power. So it's going to be hard, but it, we can see that the disruption from a, a growing number and intensity of extreme climate events is also really hard, and it's actually threatening now the the stability of global society. Yeah, one thing we talked about, it, um, and this is again back in Paris, but it, it was eight years ago now, it, we talked about the response needs to be as exponential as the as the rises the you know the feedbacks that we're getting and it seems that we're we're a long way since paris in terms of public engagement but also up the steeper curve of feedbacks as well um so hopefully we can meet the we can meet the exponential of climate change it's the exponential age. Uh, we got to get on those exponential curves somehow and try to steer them uh, towards stability, not just for human society, but for nature surrounding. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you. Yeah. Stay cool.